Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of the Esther Croker Show. Today I am joined by Robert Ould, who is the president of Bruges Group, and Ethan Thilburn, who is an editor and writer for Bruges Group. Robert, Ethan, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. My pleasure, thank you. Um, could you tell us a bit more about Bruges Group and why it was set up? Well, we were set up uh, back in 1989. It's following a speech by Margaret Thatcher, then, then Prime Minister, called her Bruges speech, where she set out her criticisms of the direction of European integration and really got to the core of what was wrong with the EU project. Then we were members of the uh, European community and it was going yeah. towards ever closer union. And so she set out her vision that was absolutely different, which was about independent, free trading, democratic nation states cooperating, but not being run by a central bureaucracy, not turning its back on the United States and the transatlantic alliance, particularly NATO, which we see the EU undermining at this point in time. And in the course of the world, not just focusing on this sort of fortress Europe, which was emerging, and of course, certainly not having a single country that caused so much damage in the Eurozone, where we see the massive unemployment in, in Southern yeah. Europe, and the system may be breaking just as, as we speak at this point in time. It, it really is a, a disaster. And Margaret Thatcher predicted all this, saw that there was a better way, advocated her vision, and the Bruges Group was founded to keep putting her ideas into, into practice and create the reality. And so really we did spark the whole debate on Brexit and led the way on this. And if it weren't for Margaret Thatcher's speech and setting out her criticisms of the EU and the work of the Bruges Group over many decades now, then, of course, we wouldn't be in the situation where we are now, which is outside of the European, the European Union. Union yeah. I mean, you know, we I, I personally know the Bruges Group for promoting sort of Euroscepticism and actually opening up Britain to trade with the world as opposed to just, you know, a single body or block like the European Union. But, you know, I also know that there are other um, things that the Bruges Group um, campaigns for. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Well, we've been very sort of sceptical about a lot of the climate alarmism. I yep. think a lot of the, the measures, uh, a lot of which comes from the European Union, not entirely, not entirely uh, some comes from our own government as well, previous governments. Uh, a lot of the climate alarmism has been really, in a sense, a way of getting more control by transnational organisations over the democracies of the nation states. And so we've sort of been very much involved in that. And discussing how you know defense matters as well and how how the european union is undermining nato and and so there's a very different areas because there's, there's so much to to discuss we're really sort of taking forward margaret thatcher's legacy in the conservative party and making sure her great ideas are being taken forward even in this day and age so do you think the bruges group um, advocates for an element of social conservatism and how do you think if it does the EU fits with that model well, yes, certainly, because Mar Margaret Thatcher, of course, was, in a sense, economically liberal, which is many, what many people call conservatism. The, the free free market is really important to our economic growth and our, our prosperity, and anything that undermines that, of course, damages society. There's also another sort of social impact. We see that if there's too much government control, if people are too dependent upon the state, uh, if, if they're, in, in fact, in, directly employed by the state, then people will develop this this mindset that, that the state is the answer when actually we know that quite often it can be the problem. And also yeah. there's a, many of these institutions also become rather socially liberal as well, which is which is fine for how people want to, to live their life. But it, we see with the emergence of a lot of socialism, it's become the new intolerance that people are, are often sort of castigating others as a way of virtue signaling, putting others down to try and make themselves seem, seem better. Uh, and be morally superior to, to the rest of us. So this is something we focused on because this has become a threat to, to freedom of speech, which is something that also concerns us, is that yeah. how some people are so deeply intolerant of other people's opinions. And even if that opinion is based on science and facts and well-reasoned argument, if it doesn't fit the narrative that's being pushed by certain, certain sections of, of society that want to just beat down others to have different differing points of view, then they will be ostracised and labelled as all kinds of different names. And so this is something that concerns us because it's taken 
out sort of rational debate from public discourse. And we want to bring that back where people are entitled to their opinions and can voice their opinions, can voice facts uh, without having to be shouted down and accused of something they're not, which is just really just the way that some people on what we would call the left, they, they've, they've lost all the debates. They've lost the election, yeah. they've lost many of the arguments. So what they do, is they just respond to abuse and try and think, well, OK, let's try and push that person into into a corner let's try and say that these views can't be can't be expressed and then of course they think they'll win actually they just alienate people most people who are in a sense naturally um to a degree conservative in in their with a small c in their outlook and people are just you know the metropolitan elite make themselves seem even further out of touch, so out of touch yeah. the, more they, the more they actually try and push down and try and restrict um, common sense being discussed uh, and an open debate, the more they actually alienate themselves. Their, their tactics do actually backfire. And that's why so much what the Bruges Group has stood for over many years, sometimes, you know, we, uh, we, we, we were sort of planting our flag ahead of public debate. We were sort of pushing ideas which weren't, now long, which weren't fashionable. A lot of now, what we've talked about is now coming to pass in terms of Euroscepticism, in terms of the government's immigration policy, and of course, our concerns about freedom of speech now seems that people are pushing back and saying, no, let's actually have an open, honest debate about all manner of issues and just ignore you know, the, the Guardian <laughs> or the BBC <laughs> that wants to, wants to shut down debate whenever they come across it. The, the, anything that differs from their point of view, anybody who's outside of their circle speaking out is often shut down. But, but of course, it doesn't actually work. Um, Ethan, I wanted to get your perspective as well and sort of the Bruges group, um, the, the Bruges group's role in promoting social conservatism in the UK. I mean, we've already touched on sort of Euroscepticism and promoting free markets, but I want to know what you think uh, Bruges group's role is in, you know, advocating for social conservatism. Um, well, you know, it's, uh, the last general election proved that social conservatism sort of on the rise again, Boris Johnson promoted a more socially conservative manifesto, I would believe, than what maybe David Cameron promoted. Um, and also the Conservative Party uh, won a lot of seats that are socially conservative but have never voted conservative. So a lot of seats in the northeast, uh, places like Sedgefield, the Blythe Valley. Yeah. Um, you know, Labour Heartlands that have never had uh, conservative MPs before. Um, you know, Bishop Auckland with an 8,000 Conservative majority has never had a Conservative MP. Um, overturned 10,000 majorities in Blythe Valley. I think that just goes to prove how the Conservative Party now represents social conservatism rather than the, the sort of liberal attitude that it may have taken towards under David Cameron and the coalition government. And I mean, during the um, 2016 referendum and, you know, after we had conservative MPs uh, like Anna Subri that claimed that Margaret Thatcher would be for remaining in the EU as opposed to leaving. I mean, what do you make of that, um, Ethan and Robert? Well, well I'll let you and go. And Anna Subri is one of those people that was um, well, deeply in intolerant of those who had uh, alternative points of views. I, I can remember it was on it was on Sky News, there was Leave protesters, this was just over a year ago now, and she was just accusing them of being, uh, you know, almost quote unquote, fascist and mainly racist, mainly. That that was, and that these they, they need to be sorted out. That was what she'd actually publicly said. But of course, the public expressed her, uh, expressed their judgment upon her. You know, she, she stood down as a Conservative MP, defected, stood again in the, in the election and, of course, lost. lost. One reason why she didn't, well, probably one reason why she didn't want me at the election is John Mann, uh, the Labour MP, uh, who, who, of course, now now Lord Mann, who's leading uh, lead, you know, leading the government czar, he sort of said in Parliament about uh, how, how you know, the public would be dismissing her. And she was he was absolutely right. And he was a sort of great example of someone from a Labour background who in some ways is socially conservative, although he's also a socialist, uh, who, you know, yeah. one of these sort of traditional sort of Labour people that have, in a sense, come over to the Conservatives. It's not, you know, it's not just about working class people in the north of the country. It's also people, traditional Labour people, such as, you know, even sort of Kate Hoey. Of course, they're still possibly in the Labour Party, in the Labour movement, but they've kind of, 
work very closely with sort of conservative. Yeah. There is a real sort of change in British politics that the Conservative Party now gets most of its support from working class people. And really, that's sort of something that's really quite telling, because even during the even during the Victorian era, uh, social conservatism was strongest amongst working class people, people on the sort of the, who live sort of in more precarious lives than than the than wealthy elite who are often libertines, they yeah. knew the value of having strong communities and strong social institutions and valuing the things which bind us together. That's really important. And you know, we see at this moment in time, we need we need things that keep us together. Together, especially yeah. in such a diverse our shared, of, our shared sense of identity. And, yeah. and so this is sort of really important. So for those who are, uh, who have the, the the wealth and the means to move anywhere, uh, the, the so-called anywheres and somewheres debate, you know that they they don't need and have less regard for strong social, social, strong social fabric which binds us together. But those yeah. who, for those who, uh, uh, who 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 don't, you know, the, the people that we should be working for in politics actually value our sort of traditions, our culture, and our identity, and all the things that keep us together and keep keep the society functioning well and that's, 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 I'm just going to jump in here Robert because I want to know um I want to know a bit of what you think Ethan about whether Margaret Thatcher would actually have been a Remainer I mean that's quite an interesting um sort of topic or you know point of contention to bring up especially for someone like Anna Subri do you really think that Margaret Thatcher would have wanted to remain in the EU um definitely not I mean in her own autobiography um she talks about how she could never have signed the Maastricht Treaty uh, which John yeah. Major signed in 1992. In the Bruges speech back in 1988, she talked about how our future's in Europe, but not only in Europe. Um, which, you know, that, that just goes to show how she wanted cooperation with Europe. She still wanted to remain friends, but it doesn't mean that everything has to be centred around uh, the European yeah. Union or centred around Brussels. So, no, not all. I don't think she would have been a, a Remainer. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. certainly would have wanted to leave. Uh, Margaret Thatcher said to me, um, we should, shouldn't should be in the European Union, should never have been in the European Union. Margaret Thatcher was clearly for leave, of course, passed yeah. away uh, 8th of April 2013. But Margaret Thatcher had really spearheaded so much of uh, the opposition to the Maastricht Treaty, uh, fighting against the single currency, so much of uh, the the ideology then the 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 beliefs that she had put out there had, had been adopted she was absolutely definitely for leaving the yeah. eu absolutely and you know anna subri is gone from british politics now the public have passed their judgment we are moving forward without her <laughs> or without people like her more like <laughs> I, I wanted to uh, get your opinion on this robert because i you know since the referendum and especially in the immediate aftermath of the referendum, you could see a huge divide in this country. I mean, it took us three years to actually finally move on, get a clean break from the European Union, even though that hasn't completely manifested yet. And obviously the last general election showed the kind of swing effectively towards let's just get on with this. Um, do you think the country is still deeply divided over Brexit or do you think there's sort of a amends that's being made and people on both the Leave and the Remain side are kind of just coming to terms with it and trying to move on? After after the Leave vote, um, nearly four years ago now, most yeah. people in, in the public, according to the opinion polls, wanted to get on and leave. The, whether they voted Leave or Remain, they wanted to get on and see see it delivered. Yeah. Whatever their views are on on this on this topic, they wanted to, wanted to move forward. Didn't want a second referendum, um, and of course wanted actually, according to the opinion polls, a full exit from the EU, and actually preferred leaving the EU fully rather than all the different various soft Brexit options, some of which may yeah. or may not have had uh, a great deal of uh, efficacy. They may, 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 may have been the right solution or not. But the fact is, is that according to the polls, people wanted to move on. It was only really an elite, because the European Union is always an elite project. It's about amassing power away from people, uh, self-appointed, wise technocrats who will make the decision yeah. for us, those people who know best. Of course, we are... Often we actually want to have people making good decisions to actually get people to make the, the decisions themselves. That's why markets function better than, than, than state control. That's oh, yeah. why free markets defeated communism and, and socialism, which are ideas that uh, exist only in, well, 
the extremes of the Labour Party or North Korea. <laughs> um, but yeah. so most people wanted wanted to wanted to um, move move forward. It was just a, it was just a minority uh, in power that didn't. And the more the more they fought against Brexit, they were always pyrrhic victories. The more they angered people, and that's what you know, it, it showed in the election, where people were absolutely um, fed up with with the Labour Party. Many people in the Labour Party had voted to leave. Uh, voted Conservative to get Brexit done. They wanted this delivered and people were a lot happier. And there was there was never really a case for a second referendum. It was never ahead in the opinion polls. It's just a well-funded, often by uh, out, outside funds from wealthy, wealthy people who are interfering in British politics, trying to overturn the result. They had a well-organised, good press briefing operation and got got new channels and newspapers often talking about a second referendum but the public didn't want it of course if there were to have been a second referendum leave would have won with an even bigger margin of victory yeah and i think that would have been, been, would have been great you know, but, but, but i think um, that's what we needed we needed a big vote that finally put everything to rest which i definitely think the public, the public do want us to be out of the and they want to go forward they want the hope and the yeah. options this is one reason why they like boris johnson because he talks positively and optimistically he has hope the guardian might might not like that but people actually do and why not why can't we be positive why can't we look forward and that's what brexit is all about and that's what the people wanted and the debate is now over and if for those who aren't reconciled to this then they are just undermining their own positions because they need to move forward with their lives. It's over, you know. Yeah, over about, years. I got so sick of hearing about Brexit because it was just like, it doesn't matter what side you voted on. This is the reality. We just need to stop talking about it. We need to stop having people fund campaigns to get a second referendum or mm. tell everyone they were racist for voting to leave. So I think this is definitely a good way to put that to rest. Um, Ethan, I wanted to ask you um, a bit of a speculative question here. Um, do you think, you know, because there is a bit of concern about the younger generations and um, definitely the influence of left-wing politics amongst younger people, do you think some t at some point in the future we would rejoin the EU if it still exists? Um, I'd, I'd like to say we wouldn't. Um, I mean, that this coronavirus crisis could quite well end the EU how we know it today. Um, yeah. the, the discontent in Italy and Spain and Greece, uh, even in Portugal and Poland and Hungary, th there's a lot of countries who aren't happy the way the EU's run. So I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing big changes within the EU. I'm not saying that might be the end of the EU, but I certainly think it will be the end of how we know it today. Um, I think among younger people, it is a bit of a majority of people who want in Europe but it seems to be the the more metropolitan elitist people and the, the champagne socialism of the, yeah. the new Labour Party that want uh, to rejoin the European Union a lot of people who I know uh, of a you know of the, of the younger generation um, are, are quite happy to, to try and make something out of Brexit and are confident that once we we get over the first few hurdles of getting trade deals, which I think will come into place uh, soon enough. Um, I think we'll be very much out of the, the EU for good now, definitely. Yeah. Well, what do, you think, do you think the EU will still exist <laughs> in the next few years? Well, there's every possibility that Italy uh, will have to leave the single currency. It's, the opinion talks about solidarity. That means doing as institutions, as central institutions, and as uh, often with the dominance of, uh, of Angela Merkel and the ECB based in Frankfurt, uh, telling them what to do. Uh, of course, if there's actually no, very little support, the European Union just fails at almost everything <laughs> it touches. And of course, we see that the, the crisis in, in Italy, which is destroying them. It, economically, of course, this has been going on now for over a decade because of the imbalances within the single currency, about how the exchange rate uh, helps German exporters, but countries in southern Europe find it yeah. really hard to, to to compete. This is sort of something the Bruges Group's been writing on for quite some time. We're seeing the decline, the decline in, in, in the European economy. The rest of the world is powering ahead. And the only way out of this is, of course, for, for Germany to underwrite 
uh, or countries like Germany, uh, the Netherlands, Finland, uh, though, those with big sort of budget surpluses, although actually Germany does have actually quite a degree of debt at the moment. Yeah. Uh, not as bad as other, other countries, but it's, it, it, it's there. And a lot of German financial institutions have been, been somewhat in trouble. Deutsche Bank was nearly going bust. Uh, yeah. But we see, unless they're going to underwrite the debts of Southern Europe, transfer their funds, massive fiscal transfers from Northern Europe to Southern Europe, then the project will not work. Countries like Germany, Finland, they don't want to be funding that. They will not be funding that. It won't get through their courts, even their political process. If people will not tolerate it. They leave, to get money, Italy then requires massive amounts of liquidity. Of course, it cannot get this access to these funds unless it starts issuing its own debt. It's issuing, and this, this will ultimately lead to a parallel currency, which would replace the euro. This is what yeah. is going to, going to ultimately happen. And that's the only way, because the Cent European Central Bank is, is fired all of its... Uh, weapons that it has it's big money sort of bazookas it's it's done that. you know it, it hasn't made any real difference it's just put off the evil day we need to see a breakup of the eurozone and we need to see that irrelevant in this whole process we've seen national government saying we are going to put in border restrictions we are going to take these measures independently of the european union the whole european union project has actually sort of been broken down by this coronavirus uh, crisis and I mean, the, not, Robert, Robert, I'm sorry, I'm just going to jump in for a second. If you were a betting man and you had to say the EU will still exist five to ten years from now, yes or no, which where would you place your money? I would say that it won't exist in in this form. It might you yeah. know, drag on for for a few more years, just like say, for instance, the Holy Roman Empire was there yeah. in name only, but people, yeah. uh, governments will start to be ignoring it. And this process has already begun. We've seen uh, countries such as uh, Hungary and the, the Visegrad groups of states in Eastern Europe have been rejecting uh, European Union quotas on migration. They'd be saying, no, we are not going to, to take uh, the citizens with Angela Merkel open the borders, so we're not going to take the people that you've mistakenly taken in. You're not going to dump them on, on onto us. When, of course, that really they want to go to countries like Sweden and, and Germany. Germany's trying to push them out to Eastern Europe. So we see that we've already seen this this happen. This this sort of process has begun. The dominance of the uh, you know how, how many divisions does Brussels have? You know, none. It, ultimately, it cannot tell the European states what to do. And as so long as there's a will, they can enact their own policies, just like they've abandoned freedom of movement within the European Union to deal with the corona, coronavirus crisis. Yeah. So we see the whole the whole project becoming undermined and it cannot go on because the economics are again it just doesn't work it is a failing project it always has been it always has you know damaged everything it touched from agriculture to, to fishing to finance you know with the single currency the european if you have unaccountable institutions trying to impose one size fits all policies on a diverse continent such as a large parts of, of, of europe it will inevitably fail, fail. Just like communism failed uh, just like the ussr failed it will it will not work and nation the member states will ignore it and it will become irrelevant and good riddance to it as well because it has it's responsible for massive unemployment and taking away hope from young people across southern europe who've suffered greatly as a result of the unemployment queues all in the vanity of the european union single currency which the economics were never there. The Remainers have been wrong on every single issue. Leavers and people have been Robert, correct Robert, over decades. Robert, Robert mm -hmm. I, I want to shift the conversation towards the current Conservative Party because, you know, if I was a betting man last summer, I didn't think that the Tories would get as much of a majority as they did in December. So it, it kind of shows that the, the, the weight of the country is really behind them and the weight of the country's support, especially in traditional Labour heartlands like Blythe Valley, um, I want to ask you, Ethan, what do you make of the current Conservative, part, Conservative Party's, um, you know, commitment to free markets? Because that is a huge um, part of the Bruges Group's message and mission, effectively. What, what do you make of the current um, commitment to that? Um, I, I think the Conservative Party is certainly moving back towards free markets um, now under Boris Johnson. Uh, There's the a little bit of protectionism creeping in and sort of more corporatism creeping in under 
uh, David Cameron and to some extent Theresa May. But I, I think um, that the party now is committed to, to more free trading than it has since probably the, the early 1990s. Yeah. Um, the, the, there's policies in there that I think um, that, that need to be scrapped. Uh, HS2 for a start. I think that needs to be gone. I think that completely uh, goes against the object of free markets because it's it's just a state-run project that keeps building up in 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 how the cost the cost, cost yeah yeah and it's over a hundred billion pound now and it brings absolutely no advantage whatsoever to places like the northeast Scotland Wales um so I think that there needs to be a bit of a reevaluation um of some of the policies um after this coronavirus crisis i think that uh, taxes need to be cut i think the chancellor needs to to look at his budget proposals and cut taxes um uh, and certainly speed up the development of freeport i know liz truss has been a, a big supporter of that um so i think that the party is certainly moving in the right direction towards that sort of free market thatcherite uh, ideology so I think yeah, I'm certainly no. going in the right place, yeah. What do you think, Robert? What 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 would you make of the the Tories' commitment to free markets at the moment, or is it still too early? Well, there, there is a risk that uh, with the economic harm that's been done by by the lockdown and the yeah. the, the uncertainty, and of course the, the lack of economic activity, where people you know literally cannot or certainly discouraged from going out. It really has harmed the economy globally as well, and there is always the temptation that uh, the government will think it has it has the answers and it will will borrow uh, more money uh, to stimulate the economy to get things moving again. We actually sort of know that pretty much doesn't work unless it's uh, investing in infrastructure that's definitely needed. Uh, of course, unfortunately, it seems that as Ethan was saying, it's going to be investing in infrastructure which isn't needed. HS two um, main case in point. So there is, there is that sort of danger that the Conservatives will go for the easy sort of popular, uh, well, not necessarily popular, but easy, easy sell solution to, to the media that they're going to write big checks with other people's money that uh, our grandchildren will be paying off. Uh, yeah. that, more, more, more debt. We haven't sort of got, you know, got to grips. We haven't just got to grips with the deficit. Haven't we dealt with the enormous debt yet. And we'll be piling more debt onto future generations, which will be more taxing, borrowing just to pay the interest. Uh, and, and of course, the debt that's been being accumulated. What we need to do to get the economy going, beyond sort of investment in in good infrastructure that will actually uh, be be of use and, and free ports and so forth, is of course to cut taxes to make people ha keep more of their wealth, to make sure that corporation tax is low. Of course, people paying it where of course it is uh, due, but it's actually low, and so people there will actually be a real benefit to investing in in the United Kingdom to helping our economy grow. It's about the government stepping back. That's the way to sort of turn things around, to encourage economic growth by allow, get cutting regulation, by allowing people to keep more of what they well, earn, yeah. particularly those on lower incomes as well. So that's, uh, that's how we move the economy forward. It's not by falling into the, 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 the socialist trap. Robert, do you think Rishi Sunak is going to implement, um, you know, some of the recommendations that you made, like cutting back taxes, cutting, um, keeping corporation tax as low as uh, possible? Do you think that's something that is going to be implemented in the Conservative Party, or is, is that is that a bit of wishful well, thinking? I know that's his his instinct. Of course, a lot will be decided at Number Ten because Number Ten now has uh, has a lot of the power over over Number Eleven. Uh, the Prime Minister, after all, is, is actually First Lord of the Treasury, and it seems ultimately it may actually be be his say. I know that Rishi Sunak's uh, uh, instincts are absolutely correct. I hope Boris will do do the right thing. He do, he's, a, he's an effective manager. When he was Mayor of London, he ran things very well. Taxes didn't go up. It actually ran, you know, the department in budget, unlike Sadiq Khan. It was actually <laughs> a golden, gold, golden age in, in the era of, of, of London. And, and his yeah. management. So hopefully he will. He has a good track record, and hopefully he will do do the right thing. But it would be ever so easy to just think, okay, we're going to stimulate the economy as if Maynard Keynes uh, was was still around. Uh, yeah. that's, that's not the way forward, and that will just 
that that will just lead to you know, government borrowing money, which could have been invested better privately in schemes that won't deliver good results, uh, and that, we're, that that literally our grandchildren will be paying for. That's you know we've only just got off uh, paying paying for the Second World War. We just moved beyond that. It is you know we 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 can't keep you know borrowing our way out, out, out of yeah. debt. You know. Yeah. I mean, you know you can't. Uh, Winston Churchill said, you know, taxing your way into prosperity is like asking a man to stand in a bucket and lift himself up. It, it just doesn't it work. work. Yeah. yeah, it's sort of not I easy. Mean, to one, 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 one actually would be lifting up with one pushing down. It's, you're taking money out of the economy right. when you're doing that. Sorry. Yeah, I have one last question for both of you, um, because, you know, this has been a very helpful discussion and I do I do believe a lot in the work that the British group are doing. You know, I think it's very important to have a kind of reinvigoration of uh, Thatcherite values um, in this country, especially now when everything feels so divided and muddled up and with this plague that has been thrust upon us by China. <laughs> um, so how can people learn more about the British group and get more involved, especially young people? Well, yeah, we've got a very active uh, Facebook and Twitter and Ethan's doing great things on social media as yep. well. Just log on to www.bruggegroup.com yep. and then you'll, you'll find all the links to our social media. Give me an email, get involved. That's what Ethan did. He just uh, sent me an email and gave me a call. I like the guy and so let's get, let's be, we chatted. We've been working together now for, for, about, about a year and Ethan's done some great yeah. things and excellent writing for us, really taking us forward, making, helping us make some great contacts in, in politics. We've got, the Bruges Group has excellent links already. Ethan knows some great people. He's met so many people through his involvement with the Bruges Group and through his, act, his activities in the Conservative Party. He's been a real great help to us and we can do, do with more, more like him as well. All right. So reach out, just be open and, you know, get involved, social media, all of that. Is that Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Okay, Definitely, awesome. yeah. Well, thank you so much, Robert and Ethan, for joining me today. It's been very, very interesting speaking to you both. And I hope the Bruges yeah. continues the great work you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ollie? Thank, thank you very much.